Good morning, participants. We'll be starting our next session now. And the topic is in Introduction to Circular Economy and Life Cycle Assessment. It will be taken by Professor Priyanka Korsi. To you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeevan. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start the next session. And I think you have a good break. OK, so um, can you give me the sharing right? Yes. The sharing right here. Is it visible, Ujibin? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we are starting the next session, which is on, uh, which is on. Go to the next slide. Yes, this is the introduction of circular economy and a brief introduction about the life cycle analysis, right? And if you look at the scheme, uh, we will be covering the progress so far where from we started talking about uh, the life cycle assessment, the whole idea of sustainability, uh, what is circular economy and how it is different from linear economy. This is what it basically means, uh, followed by the life cycle assessment. You know, the, the bone of sustainability into it, the development of LCA, how it evolved over the period of time, what are the various varieties of LCA and uh, the limitations, and then we will try to conclude it over next hour and a half time. And this is how the day has been planned. After uh, uh, lunch, we will be coming back and do some kind of, an, uh, we will try to understand the technicalities of life cycle assessment because we are hearing a lot about uh, the carbon footprints, we are hearing a lot about GHG emissions and how they are calculated. You know, when we talk about, see, as a scientist and as an engineer and as a practitioner, we should not be talking about uh, it is more dangerous and it is less harmful. What makes sense is let's give some number to it. Because when we give number or when we sit down to calculate those numbers, we understand uh, the science behind those numbers, we understand uh, the pitfalls behind those numbers, because many a time, what will happen? We will be hearing about, we will be, we will see lots of number, and we really don't know how the number has been calculated. And many a time, it eludes us. You know, we are fooled by those numbers as well. Therefore, it is very important that we understand how these numbers are calculated. So, what I'll do uh, in this presentation today, I will be covering, I will be covering the fundamentals of it as much as I can, because. Life cycle analysis, life cycle assessment in itself is a, is a stream, it's a domain. But briefly, whatever we can, uh, we will try to do that. We will also try to give you some hands-on after lunch. And then with an assumption that uh, next time when you see such life cycle assessment report, you understand how those calculations have happened, or at least you question those calculations, right? That's, that's, the, that's the idea behind uh, uh, you know, scheduling this session. So if you look at so far, everything has been very linear in our approach. Any industry, anything that we are doing, if you look at it, it has a very linear approach. That means when I set up a industry, if I ask you that you are an entrepreneur and you want to set up your own industry, where do you start from? The first thing we do is we identify uh, the business where we can make more profit depending upon your geographical location and the need of the people, locally, globally, whatever it is. So you do a, a, a SWOT analysis for yourself and you identify that, okay, fine, I see that there is a, a let's take an example of drinking water, right? So I identify that uh, uh, there is a problem, there's a cute problem of drinking water in my uh, neighborhood or in my country or in my province, wherever I'm living. And therefore I see an opportunity to sell water okay there's nothing harm in it and you decided to set up a, a water bottling plant you know, a plant where water is bottled packaged into a bottle and it is sold out now the next question is what would be the size of the plant how many bottles per day you want to produce that comes from what kind of a customer you have so you identified the customer also that okay i will i assume that i will be able to cater 1000 families uh, per day. That roughly means and assuming that every, every household, every family is consuming, let's say one liter per day, 
giving just fake numbers, one liter per day, and there are four such members in a family that makes four liter per day, and 1,000 such families that makes 4,000 liters per day. So I'll be setting up a plant of 4,000 liter bottling plant, and I'll be bottling it in one liter bottle. So that means 4,000 bottle per day is what I'm planning to do. So you do these calculations and you've come up with the size of your plant. So you, you decided to set up a water bottling plant, which has a capacity of 4,000 one liter bottle per day, because that's what you estimate uh, would be your kind of a customer that you are looking at. Now to set up that 1,000, 4,000 bottle, you, 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 know, you construct the factory, you ensure all the raw material and everything. And when we start from the finished product that we are looking at, and in this case, we are looking at 4,000 one liter bottle. And you do the back calculation and you see how much raw material you would be needing. For example, if you're setting up a, a, a reverse, reverse osmosis, let me say as the RO water system, then you see that the discard rate of RO water system is very high. It's only at an average, it takes 30% of the water as the purified water and about 70% of the water is rejected. Right? So you could understand that if you're setting up a 4,000 liter uh, bottling plant, you need that and that is only 30% of a number, then what is the raw material or the water that you need? I mean, if you could quickly do the calculation and somebody can tell me the number. So to set up a 4,000 liter, I'm doing it myself as well with all of you. Here is my calculator. Yes, so I said that you need 4,000 liters of clean water. And if you're setting up an RO water, which takes the raw water, purifies it, and gives you 4,000 liters of water at the end of the day. And the purification efficiency of the uh, RO water is 30%. So what is the raw material that I'm looking at? Uh, uh, the net amount of water that I need. Quickly, I have the number with me. If anyone of you could quickly tell me. The RO, the reverse osmosis based system roughly purifies only 30% of the water and remaining 70% is discarded. We would so need when, uh, yeah. 5,200. How much? Come again, I couldn't hear because two of you started speaking at the same time. So if you could tell me the number one by one. You, you said 30% and then 30% of 4,000 liters is 1,200. So plus then the 4,000 is 5,002. So what's the number? Yes, Emily, 5, what's the number? 5,200 liters. Okay, Emily, what's the number that you were giving me? Somebody else also gave me a number. Hello, yeah, ma'am, we would need around 13,300 liters. Right, so uh, earlier I thought I think uh, the gentleman, what you were saying, uh, probably uh, you interpreted the question, I think, uh, a bit wrong here. What I said is that you need clean water, 4,000 clean water, 4,000 liters of clean water. And the, the, the technology that I'm using here, this, this here, the production, let's say this is technology as well. And at this point, the technology that I'm using is a reverse osmosis, popularly known as RO systems. Now, RO system will take in X amount of water and give you Y amount of water. This Y here is 4,000. And the efficiency of your RO system is 30%. So what should be your input so that at 30% efficiency, you get 4,000 here? So 30% of X, let's say 000. X amount is coming in, yes. Absolutely right. So about 13,300 something. So roughly about, yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. Right. So about 13,000, 13,300, you get 333, so 13,000, roughly 13,000, right? 
So that means if we are using an RO system, which has an efficiency of 30%, efficiency in terms of uh, product efficiency, right? So only 30% of that is purified, then you bottle it and you sell it. What happened to the remaining 70% of the water? In normal household system, I'm sure many of the household here are using our water. This water simply goes in the drain. Some of us may be a uh, little aware of uh, you know, the water conservation campaign, which is running in each and every country is doing that. Maybe we'll put it to some other use, uh, maybe cleaning of your house or maybe watering of the plant, depending upon what kind of plant could take that much salt, things, so on and so forth. But in majority of the household, this water is, you know, the outlet of that RO system is put in, the, in your sink and it just goes down the drain. So this is what linear economy is all about. All the factories, all the production houses, not just the factory, even the service sector. Service sector means I'm talking about schools, hospitals, hotels, restaurants. What do they do? They look at the final product. This, let's assume this is a final product here. There is a final product. And every other calculation is based on, you know, to meet the requirement of that finished product, what is the raw material that is required? So if I'm, if I'm, as I told you the example of water, that to get 4,000 liters of clean water, I need about 13,000 liter of raw material. And I'm working on that thing only that please ensure there is 13,000 liter of raw material coming in. I get 4,000 here, 70% is wasted. I don't care. Uh, my, I got the water, I put it in the bottling plant, it is bottled and it is sold. This is what linear economy has been. The whole world has been running on linear economy. Every product, what is the value of my uh, per liter, you know, per bottle cost? That comes from all the expenses that I have come across. So I'll do at the end of the day or at the end of the month, I'll see how much of money I have spent uh, in labor, on it paying the electricity charges in securing the raw material. The raw material would be like the raw water which is coming in. I'm sure the water is metered. Whosoever is providing you the water services, your regulatory bodies, the utilities, then the raw material, the PET bottle, this plastic bottle that we use, how much of that, uh, of course, you need. 4,000 liter means 4,000 such bottle, 4,000 such caps. Then you would also print the level because it's your company, you would like to advertise it. So there's a printing material that goes in there. And what else? Yes, pretty much so. And then you need the sealing machine, the cap that seals the cap, you know, it melts and seals the cap so that when you open it, it you, you hear the cracking sound and the, and the cap separates from the seal and then you drink it, right? So this kind of a facility you have to put in place. So you put in place, you have invested the money and you divide it per bottle, how much it is, and then you put a profit to it. Of course, the whole idea of setting up a business is to generate profit. So you see what are your operational costs? What are the major capital costs in securing those equipments, those big machines? You put all those things into uh, your metrics. And then you calculate that the per bottle, just the production cost is coming out to be one unit of your currency. So $1, one rupee. Uh, you know, whatever currency you are using. Let's assume that. And then you put up a profit to it. So let's say I'm putting a 10% profit over it. That is my earning. I'm setting up this business, so I'm making a 10% profit, 10, 15, 20, depending upon your conscious. You decide to sell it at that price. Okay. What I have not done, that when I'm deciding the price of my product, one liter bottle, I did not consider using the 70% of the water which is being rejected. Right? What happened to that 70% of that water? If I start using this 70% of this water for certain things, because I have paid a price for it, I have paid the utility, you know, this water supplying agency, the way we get electricity, water is also metered. In majority of the country, it is metered. Some way they give it for free. Certain sections are given free, like agriculture and all are provided free of cost in uh, water and sometimes electricity as well. But for all businesses where there is, you know, you will make profit out of it, uh, the water is, it's sold. You, you buy it at a certain price. So you, you have paid the price for it. Even for the plastic bottles that you have used, you have paid the price for it, right? What happened after the water bottle is being used by the customer? What is it that he or she is doing with that water bottle? They throw it away. 
we also, you know, there is uh, many countries, they run a campaign where they say that you squeeze the bottle, destroy it completely before you throw it so that nobody could use it for wrong purposes. You know, all these duplicate thing where you take the bottle, you fill normal tap water and you put the seal and you sell it. You assume that the water is purified, but it is not. Such businesses are also there. So as an awareness campaign, what do we do? Because then your brand value goes down. You know, you have, you have been working in selling clean drinking water for last 5, 10, 15, or 20 years or 100 years, and you have your brand has got a reputation, all this big brand, and then somebody starts to dupe all those things, collect those bottles, fills in unpurified, just raw water, and is selling it uh, under your name, under your banner, you lose your reputation. Your company loses your reputation. So what these companies are now doing, they came up with this campaign thing that you destroy the bottle completely so that it loses its shape or you throw the bottle at one place and the cap at different place so that you, the entire assembly is not available for someone to uh, counterfeit, right? So those kind of a campaign are there, but that is more about protecting their band and brand and protecting uh, uh, basically their own image, right? But now let's look at uh, from environmental point of view, from uh, savings point of view. So let's look at this raw material. So one raw material is the water which is being discarded. So what do you do with that water? Can that water be put some good use? Can I recycle the water somewhere in my own system? Because my factory is not just much. This is the production line. There are workers who are coming in my factory, those who are working in it. What kind of water they are using in their toilet? Can I collect this water and recycle it and put it in the toilets that they are using? I don't have to pay extra money to fill those uh, water tanks in the toilet. How do we proceed? That is the question. Right? So if you have thought about it, and many are doing it, I'm not talking about something very ingenious. Many companies are doing it. What do they do? They take this water, which is coming out as a discard from this technology from the main processing plant, and they are putting it to some use, maybe in the flushing tank, uh, if it is, or, or in mopping and sweeping. Uh, if the salt percentages are lower uh, and the kind of grass that you are growing is good, it could be used there. Or <clears throat> if there is a nearby other factory, which is which requires such kind of salty water, for example, maybe you could sell it to them. Or maybe you could just heat, you, you add some process heat, you, you put an electrical plant, you heat this water, and then the price goes up. And this heated water could be supplied to the nearby uh, processing plant or the factory, whatever it is, right? The idea is, can I add value <clears throat> to this discard? This concept was not there earlier. This circular economy that we're talking is all about circularity. That means you, 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 know, you make these bends, make it circular, make it as circular as you can. So that at the end of the day, the waste which is coming out of your factory, you know, the factory is basically, your factory is this whole thing. This whole thing is your factory. Right. So this this whole thing is your is your factory. What you have seen here is just the uh, the supply chain. But then there is there is a toilet which is required here. There are workers who are working in here. Many things, right? So so when we do this calculation, <clears throat> and I'm putting there is a gate, let's say here, at your factory where all the raw materials are coming in and the raw water is coming in, the, the, the workers are coming in, all sorts of things are coming in. And then there is a gate here where all sorts of things are coming out. So there's a finished product which is coming out, which is your water. Then the workers who have come in the warm morning, they are, they, are, they are leaving in the evening and other sorts of outputs are also coming in. So at the end of the day or end of the year, business year, if I set up a, a boundary here, which includes everything, not just not just the, the supply chain, the workers and man flow and everything. And then I see what kind of emissions I'm doing. This is what life cycle assessment is all about. This is what circularity is all about. So that the net amount of waste which is coming out, the net waste, please pay attention to it. The net amount of waste. Waste is not just in terms of plastic waste. The waste is in terms of emissions. When you are packaging it, what is the net amount of emission that you are doing? You are running a, uh, you know, as I told you to put up the water and seal it, you are using some kind of a heat to seal it, right? So how is that heat coming from? It is coming from electricity. How is that electricity coming from? 
where are you getting that electricity what is the carbon footprint of that electricity we studied it yesterday what is the carbon footprint of that electricity is the electricity green yes it can be green let's say you have this assembly line available with you and on the roof of your factory you have put up solar panels yeah you calculated how much your you require energy how much electricity you require and you realize that you have enough roof area available and you could meet you can meet if not 100% even if you are meeting let's say 30% of your total electrical requirement you know through the solar rooftop you are bringing down your emissions certainly by 30% maybe more right and this is what more and more companies are doing now we talked about this portfolio of carbon credits and uh, internal internalizing the cost of carbon yesterday evening this is all about internalizing the cost this is all about calculating your hotspots where which all points in your entire process are carbon intensive or are emission intensive let's identify that and design a solution so that we could minimize it if not make it zero ideally try to make it zero okay so this is what <clears throat> is the necessity of life cycle assessment and you see many countries and many businesses i gave you the example of ikea yesterday so they are one of the biggest furniture line in the world so what they do one line of their furniture as i told you is says that they have sourced it from carbon uh, they have sourced the material from a sustainable forest what does that mean that means they have put in they have studied the forest they have put a boundary across that forest and did the calculation and realized that if they are taking out wood at a certain rate x rate then the forest has the natural you know all living thing have this tendency to bounce back to you know to resist such changes so it it will grow it will naturally replenish itself so the rate at which it is adding wood to its you know to or carbon to its uh, boundary this is the boundary of the forest let's say and at the same rate i am taking out that means in totality there is net zero extract did you get my point so there is a forest and i'm i'm planting i'm nurturing that forest naturally man made maybe i'm giving fertilizers and taking care of it because of which it stores carbon it is growing it is storing carbon into it right at whatever rate it is storing carbon let's say it is storing 1 ton carbon per month then i am cutting only the trees that are, that is equivalent to 1 ton of carbon that means in totality this forest is uh, is not suffering there is net zero cutting of the trees or net zero cutting of the carbon tree to is not the right thing to say because if you are cutting tree you are cutting tree but net zero carbon um, evacuation right that means the net amount of carbon in the forest remains same if i started my business today today which is 17th of november 2011 i calculated that this is the forest i'll be taking my word and i calculated and i know that there is let's say 100 kg of carbon stored into it then i'll ensure and i'm doing business for next 10 years that these 100 kg of carbon remains same here so i'll plant some trees i'll nurture i'll nourish so that they you know they they take in more carbon in themselves and i keep on extracting let's say 10 kg of carbon every day or every month whatever it is plain simple mathematics appears to be then there are a lot of other peripheral calculation that we have to do all these externalities have to be brought in what do we mean by externalities all those things we will try to understand right so global gdp as you can see what has happened has grown more than 20 times in the last century like we have been extracting resource like anything right and because of which there is material prosperity you can see here the whole world is witnessing this material prosperity all of us if we track back to the kind of uh lifestyle we had when we were young to the kind of lifestyle you have today when you are uh grown up you are working you have your own means of income now go back to your kitchen remember your kitchen when your mother and your grandmothers were cooking there what all electrical appliances were there was there an electrical appliance at that point of time the best of my knowledge probably the answer would be no or maybe one right but today if you look at your kitchen you would see that there are many appliances there is a kettle which is 
uh, boiling water for you. There is a microwave. There is an, probably an induction cooker as well, which is run on electricity. Uh, and uh, what else? There is a toaster, uh, other such gadgets. Right? So as we progress, and, and it all links to our human development and our economies as well and our GDPs as well, because of that, our material need has gone up. And also because we have this uh, purchasing capacity now that we can go and buy. So we are doing it, right? And because of which you see that 20 times uh, our GDPs have grown, right? So that means we are, we, are, we are more hungry for such more materialistic thing. Look at the TVs, mobile phones. Right? TV at one point of time was not there, it came. And then probably as only one item in the entire household to now every bedroom has its own television set, right? Because the price have also gone down. Anyway, the whole idea is that uh, this is what linearity is all about. When you do those TV sets, when you manufacture those TV set, all we care for is all the calculation is based on how many TV I'm producing and how much of raw material I'll be needing linearly without considering that can all these waste which is coming out could be put to some use at different processing. At every step, you will see that there is some kind of a waste which is generated. The idea is the concept of circularity is to minimize this waste as much as possible and so that the net raw material need could also be minimized because of which uh, other businesses can also uh, you know, bring less harm to the environment and to the globe. Yes, uh, ecological degradation and environmental problem, I think I've already explained this thing to you. And as you can see here, uh, we are using, the idea is this is how we all started, right? We are using a lot of resource and we were not focusing on the waste that we are using. The whole idea is that th there was, in fact, there was a direct relationship. You are using more resources and you were generating more waste. Now what we are talking about that create less waste, try to recycle things internally and uh, use less of resources without compromising on your quality, without compromising on your uh, quality. Both the things should not be compromised, right? And just very quickly, uh, just to give you an understanding about what climate change has brought to us, let me share a video with you all, very quick video. It's not being very friendly to us lately. It's a hard truth that the earth is not being very friendly to us lately. It's a hard truth that 2021 is the very difficult period for worldwide people. Endless suffering seems to be a new normal. The heat waves, drought, wildfires, rains and floods makes us all feel miserable. If you dig into these news, you may notice a common word that's climate change. To know more about this, continue watching. Hi. I am Benny Long. In this video, I am talking about the journey of Earth's climate change. Climate researchers use every possible way to study the full history of Earth's climate from the latest satellite observations to samples of prehistoric ice extracted from glaciers. According to their observation, our planet Earth is getting warmer. Yes, most of us agree with them. I am not going to prove that fact in this video. But I would like to walk you through how we got here. Long ago, our earth was the most beautiful and comfortable place for all living beings. And it is the only planet where we can live. What makes it so unique? It's greenhouse gases. You might be surprised to hear this, but it's true that greenhouse gases are a great blessing to us. Earth's atmosphere is the blanket of gases that surrounds our home planet. When sunlight reaches the earth, some energy is reflected into the space. Some of the heat is absorbed by the gases in the atmosphere and radiated in all directions, warming the earth. These heat trapping gases are called greenhouse gases. If it weren't for the greenhouse gases, earth's ocean would be frozen solid. Yes, it is dumb who keep our earth warm enough to all living beings to live. The six main greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, ozone and carbon dioxide. 
Carbon dioxide is so good at holding in heat from the sun that even a small increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can cause earth to get even warmer. It is a colorless, odorless gas that is produced naturally when humans and animals breathe. Plants take in this carbon dioxide and give away oxygen. Thus, plants and animals depend on each other and so the cycle remained balanced. Everything was going well until the invention of steam engine and then the world changed forever. This big change is called the industrial revolution. Steam engines use hot steam from boiling water to drive the pistons back and forth. This steam was produced by heating water by burning coal. That's the dangerous part. Now you may wonder what is coal and why it's so dangerous. For hundreds of millions of years, plants have lived and died. Their remains have gotten buried deep beneath earth's surface. The heat and pressure turned the plants into coal. This coal is a carbon rich material. When coal burns, its carbon combines with oxygen in the air and forms carbon dioxide. Later, we started burning coal for electricity generation. Even now, most of our electricity comes from burning fossil fuels, mostly coal and natural gas. As technology grows, we started traveling a lot. Cars, trains, buses and trucks, those run on conventional gasoline, diesel and other fuels emit carbon dioxide. So as we burn more and more coal, the carbon dioxide is produced more and more, which leads to the imbalance in the cycle. As we all know, too much of anything is bad, the excess carbon dioxide is warming up our planet slowly. This human-induced warming has reached approximately 1 degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level in 2017. If this continues, the global warming is likely to increase 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052. The global sea level has risen by about 8 inches since 1880. This is projected to rise another 1 to 8 feet by 2100. This is the result of added water from melting ice lands and expansion of seawater as it warms. The Arctic Ocean is expected to become ice-free in summer before mid-century. Understanding this danger, world leaders signed an agreement in 2015 known as Paris Agreement. Its goal is to limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. A few degrees makes a big difference. We may wonder what is the big difference between 1.5 degrees Celsius increase and 2 degrees Celsius increase. Frequency and magnitude of extreme weather events like wildfire, storm, floods, drought and heat waves due to this half degree differential would increase exponentially. On August 9, 2021, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released its sixth assessment report after eight years of research. This report has 234 authors and was subjected to review from numerous climate experts and government officials. It states, global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius will be exceeding during the 21st century unless deep reduction in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decades. Sea levels are rising faster. Indian Ocean is warming faster than the global average. The worst part is, even if we manage to immediately stop burning fossil fuels, the already released carbon dioxide will continue to warm the planet for a while. That makes achieving the Paris Agreement more challenging. What can we do now? It's now time to take baby steps. Let's spread the news and make everyone aware of this danger so that our political leaders will be pressured to take a wise decision. Let us all fight together. Let's make the earth a peaceful place for our next generation. If you are interested to know the alternative method of producing electricity, I have few videos on Right, so that was very briefly um, an update in terms of what is happening in uh, the climate 
debates and the climate discussion. We recently concluded, we all know, the COP26. So COP21 happened in Paris um, about five, six years back. And then a lot of major decisions were taken. You know, this was a pledge that came forward that let's limit it to uh, below two degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 if possible. And we just saw in the video that uh, the importance of these 0.5 degrees, right? And what is it that could be done? And therefore, I mean, if you look at the kind of lifestyle that we have today, developing, underdeveloped, developed, all sorts of economies, uh, the material consumption has gone up. And material consumption could be in any form. Uh, for certain countries, these materials are the very mini basic necessities, like you know, what are primarily your right. And then uh, there is lifestyle choices, right? That is far and beyond what are required in minimum quantity for your survival. Like electricity, yes, is required. I think it, it supports, it gives you an opportunity to uh, live a dignified life. Similarly, access to clean cooking fuel is, uh, is absolutely required to each and every citizens in the country, I mean, in, in the world, in fact. But access to, uh, you know, some, for example, I mean, I could think of this, uh, access to some kind of a gaming console. You know, all those gadgets that are used, not just by children, but elders as well to, to play, uh, is it really required? And to an extent, the way we use it, so all those things uh, need to be, you know, we need to sit back and we have to look at it. And if the answer is yes, everybody needs it, for example, let's assume because uh, the whole idea of life cycle analysis is to do scenario analysis, right? So you create a scenario and you see what kind of an emission it will produce because you have to have those numbers, even if you don't agree that all of us, you know, all the 7.5 billion people in the world should use a gaming console. The, uh, the debate is should they use or should they not use is a separate thing. But let's assume, because scientific work starts with an assumption, with an hypothesis, that let's assume all of the people here start using this gaming console. What will happen? I need to give a number to it. So life cycle analysis is all about giving number to it. So if all of us start using this gaming console, what kind of raw materials are required to ensure that everybody has access to it, right? Uh, where will it be produced? Who will be producing it? Which country will be producing it? How will it reach to your, uh, to your store from where you will buy it? Right? So everything needs to be checked. And if we do, this, do all the calculation on a piece of paper, complex piece of paper, we need supercomputers for it, we put all those data into it. And then at the end of the day, it gives us a value that each and every people, all the 7.4 billion people in the world, if they start using... Uh, gaming console, this is the kind of emission that will happen. Only for the production of that gaming console, that is one thing when it will be produced, let's say it is produced in China, most of the product in the world is coming from China, produced in China, this will be the emission. Then from China, it will be transported to all your countries, you could see the port and the distance and you could see the ships that will be required, you could calculate the fuel that would be required, you could calculate uh, all those things, right? Emissions that are happening because of the burning of the fuel and the construction of the ship as well, because those ships, I gave you the calculation yesterday that in its lifetime, how much round it is making and your one round also count. So that would be accounted into and uh, uh, it reaches the port from port. It is transported to your retail sector, to the retailer and from there to the shop, all the transportation it does, it comes to your home, you use it. And after you have used it, uh, what happened to it? How do you dispose it? Do you just simply throw it in the garbage uh, where it goes in the landfill or things like that? Or you put it in a, a designated place where some of its component could be extracted and put to some reuse. You know, such kind of things were not happening before. The idea of recycling, reusing, reducing was not there. The concept of three R, four R, six R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, that's three R. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most popular uh, R symphony, but there are six R's as well. There are many such R's, right? So all those concepts are slowly evolving, evolving everywhere on the globe at a different pace, depending upon different realities, but all are responding to it, which is a good sight, right? So this whole circular economy and this life cycle is about quantifying, quantifying the potential threats, quantifying the real threats 
and quantifying how you can minimize those threats. Therefore, life cycle analysis comes by a different name, is very important uh, and plays a very important role in, uh, in climate mitigation uh, strategies. Right? And circular economy, in very brief and layman's language, as I told you, it is all about minimizing your waste. Right, so environmental problem we have seen, and we are dwindling. Look at the natural resource extraction. I gave you the number of how, uh, how many million uh, oil wells are just abundant just like that. Now, why they have been abundant? Because uh, whatever is economically viable has been extracted out of it. Uh, what is now remaining, there is of course a good amount of oil remaining in there, but at the price at which oil is traded, it is not economical to dig it out. Simple, the cost of digging it out would be more than the cost of selling it. So you end up making loss. Therefore, those wells are abundant. So such natural resources, we are extracting huge of it. We are depleting it. We are burning fossil fuel. GHG emissions are increasing, as you can see here, huge amount of waste which is generated. I don't know about your city, but every city, I mean, if you look at the waste here, sorry, if you look at the waste here, this huge amount of waste. I live in Delhi, which is capital of India. And there is a dump site where they keep on dumping. It's a landfill site. It goes to the landfill, but before that it is dumped. But the rate at which it is going to the landfill and the rate at which it is getting dumped, uh, it has created a huge mound. It almost looked like a mountain of, of garbage. And this garbage is nothing but full of polythenes and plastics. Primarily, there are other sorts of waste also, but it is uh, the, one of the bigger menace here are the plastics. How to handle these plastics, right? They don't uh, degrade, they don't biologically degrade, and so on and so forth, right? So because of all these uh, lifestyle changes that we are witnessing, uh, we are creating lots of problem downstream as well. And as a result, as you can see here, when this kind of mounds are created like mountain thing, you create an anaerobic condition inside these mounds. Morning, you studied about the biogas thing. Biogas is nothing but uh, a raw form of methane. And we know that the global warming potential of methane is much more higher than that of CO2, right? So, um, so when you such mounds are created, then inside after a few inches of, you know, of inside that, the, uh, the, the material which is lying in there has an anaerobic condition. There is no supply of oxygen. It's cut off. And because of which it, it decomposes, uh, biologically decomposes, right? And releasing lots of methane. So one threat is, yes, it is as such creating environmental problem. And because of this degradation, because there are some organic material which are also trapped, food, trash, and all those things, uh, cardboards, they're also made out of uh, 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 trees and carbohydrates, right? So they are uh, broken down, they are disintegrated with these microbes and methane is released. So they, they are also big source of methane emission. And yeah, all this extreme weather because of which, because of this climate change that has happened, we have already seen it. So the question is, how do we define sustainable development? I think all of us must have heard it at one point or not, but let's just revise it one more time. It is the development that meets the need of the present generation without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. So that we very judiciously use the resources because it takes millions and millions of years for coal and fossil and other resources to form. And uh, the rate at which we are extracting it, has, it will come to an end. I mean, if you look at it, many countries, they have come to an end in terms of their coal reserve. India, for example, we have very good amount of coal with us, but we know that the rate at which we are extracting, uh, we can go only up to 100 years, right? Uh, if we increase more, maybe 50 years, it all depends, right? But certainly the way we are extracting it, it is not the same rate at which it is being produced. So therefore, it is very important that uh, when we talk about sustainable development, it is impossible that we talk about responsible resource extraction. The word is extraction because we're digging it out from the earth, then producing it like we're processing it. Coal is the way it is extracted. It is not the same way it is used in power plant. After being extracted, you, you subject it to certain treatment. And that is what production is all about. And then usage, when you are burning it in a power plant, how you are using, using it. Right, and then what is it that is biodegradable? What fraction could be recyclable? Is it ozone friendly or not? And you have to design uh, to make it environmentally environment friendly. And one such design, somebody talked about it in terms of power plant is the CCUS, that is carbon capture 
is one and then there are two options either you store it or you utilize it or you partly store and partly utilize it all comes from the life cycle analysis right so what what percentage should go in utilization what percentage should go in storage there are various kind of storage geological storage is what people are not talking about it what does geological storage mean it basically means that all the oil wells and other uh, structures earth structure that are empty where there are hollow space we fill it with co2 and we cap it close it seal it right so that is and there will be an expert talk on geological storage of uh, uh, of this captured carbon uh, if, if not this week certainly next week i mean you could check the uh, the program outline we have given it to you there so uh, we have this MDGs that was a Millennium Development Goal. It ended and in 2015, and then we started, we came up with this uh, another set of goals known as a Sustainable Development Goal, uh, wherein we have about 17 goals. These are the 17 goals. I'm sure all of us have seen these goals. And in, in this goal, there are certain targets. Like you have, if you meet those targets, only then the goal is achieved. And the first one, as you understand, which was the first for MDG as well, when the Millennium Development Goal came in, was no poverty and then zero hunger and so on and so forth. You could say good health, quality education, gender equity, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy seven, SDG seven, then uh, decent work and economic growth, industrial innovation and infrastructure. And now if you look at it, now that we have studied and talked about all the climate change uh, and the forces which are bringing in, you see that there is a direct link of all of them, right? Uh, health, education, important, water, and sanitation, very important, right? Clean energy, ultimate importance, right? I mean, everything is derived from this energy. Economic growth that is required, everybody needs that, right? Industrial innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequality, sustainable cities and communities, transport and everything and building sector, responsible consumption and production, link at the land use change, how much we are producing, how much we are consuming what kind of a degradation, what kind of a change we are bringing to our land and to our water bodies. Climate action, life below water, life on land, important, right? And peace, justice, and strong institutions. And of course, to achieve all those things, partnership is very important. Single-handedly or single country cannot bring in the change, the scale that we are looking at uh, alone. So we all have to come together. And so these are the 17 goals that, have, uh, that came into existence in 2015. Uh, all the member state of United Nations agreed to it and they are working for it. Circular economy, I already uh, discussed briefly in the previous slides, basically to overcome the limitations of the linear consumptions, fast and flexible production system, modularities, versatilities, and adaptive, right? And it has a competitive advantage. Look at it, same thing. If instead of making it a circular, if I just stretch it into a, uh, into as a line and remove all these things. So this is this is the boundary if I have to put in, right? So this is uh, the boundary that I'm putting in. This is my factory. This is this could be my power plant. It could be anything, right? Now, whatever material is coming in, let me let me remove it from this place. Okay, let me redraw it okay so this is raw material resource extraction would be outside it waste would be outside it recovery let's put it in and manufacturing is let's say call it as the product thing so this is the boundary so when you do life cycle analysis, setting out the boundary is very important. We'll be studying it in the coming slide, right? So setting up the boundary is very important, how you have set the boundaries, because and this material and product design invariably will be outside the boundary, because this is what is coming in. So whenever you do, you know, if you look at the history of life cycle analysis, initially it was the work done by the chemical engineers, and they did it as the mass and energy flows. Very little, initially there were very little awareness about uh, when all the factory system came up about uh, environment and the waste that we are generating. It was all about how much material is coming in, how much energy is coming in, and how much material is going out. This is all we wanted to know, right? So from there, 
in about 100 years time we have come to a point where we are saying no just knowing about how the material is coming and it is distributed among various things you know uh, the various manufacturing unit where you chopping cutting processing boiling whatever if you are a food industry packaging these are the various processes and oper units that are going through it is also important to know that how much amount of energy each unit is taking how much amount of emission is coming from each of these processing plant and do take some judicious action to reduce it right and this is what is circularity is all about so i look at it if i could recover something so what if you look at the juice industry you know, those fruit juice industry what they are now doing is that uh, i know about one industry what they do after they have extracted the juice the pineapple one right uh, it's a fibrous fruit so what they are saying that can we extract out the fiber and put the fiber to some other use can it be a raw material for paper industry otherwise they would just throw it away they will dump it right where it will set rot because it is rich in sugar still rich in sugar and produce methane so instead of that can i wash it and sell it for me it is uh, it's a waste but if a paper industry likes it and they take it they will pay me for that waste so my waste is managed otherwise i would have to pay to a waste collection agency who would have taken money from me to collect or clear off my land from that waste now i'm selling it now there is a customer who is actually buying it from me and you'll be studying about this carbon offset thing how these businesses are now getting linked that of the paper industry which otherwise was chopping the trees very carbon intense even if he's replacing this 10% of the pulp requirement through this pineapple fiber he's reducing it by 5% and he's getting all the benefit if the government policy supports uh, carbon offsetting or carbon trading right or carbon calculations some kind of a tax intensives all these market mechanisms could be put in place right so therefore they are all bringing all these all these systems into you know all these tools into their entire supply chain management yes renewable energy very important and uh, you know sometimes it is it is kind of an a uh, misused as well so here you are your and because it's a part of the calculation that's how uh, the methodology says that you the energy that you are using the electricity that you are using make it green so what these companies and this is how it push renewable energy production I, i should not say it's all bad but that's what i'm saying it's important to understand uh, what is the energy intensity of your process so that you know that uh, how you could reduce it and if at all you have to replace it that fossil energy with renewable uh, how you can do it yeah so i'll tell you, explain it to you so your plant your plant emits or requires 10 units of electricity 100 units of electricity that 100 unit you are taking from the grid the grid now grid doesn't know whether the electricity has come from fossil or it has come from uh, solar or it has come from wind it is all grid it's the same frequency the same electricity same uh, voltage which is now fed into the grid you are using 100 unit and uh, that gives you a certain kind of and that fossil energy that fossil based electricity has its embodied we discussed we will be studying it has its own embodied emission if it is coming from coal we know that it's a dirty electricity right let's let's put it this way it's a dirty electricity and when i sit down and do my carbon budgeting because i have been mandated my uh, my policy makers have said so and i see that oh my god um the product portfolio i buy green energy right so so far i was so far uh, am i audible um, ujivan yes ma'am hello yes ma'am yeah yeah you are audible okay so um let's say the product that i am making is a mobile phone right or let's the same thing water bottle itself so if i'm making the water bottle thing and i see what is the emission that is happening per bottle right so i see that i need 100 units of electricity and my 100 unit of electricity uh, i'm buying of course i'm buying from the grid and fossil fuel based electricity costs me uh 3 units currency say so it's a 3 us dollar or 3 dollar let's i mean for everybody's understanding let me cost 
say that currency, your currency, whatever currency is your there in your country, let's call it a dollar. Okay. So this is costing me three dollars. Okay. Reserve is, uh, and I buy the fossil based electricity from them, paying them three dollars. Because of which the carbon footprint of my product is high. Now, what I can do is I go to the utility, the one who is supplying this electricity to me, and I tell him that instead of giving me uh, the fossil electricity, which is $3 per unit, you give me solar electricity, which is a bit higher, maybe 3.5 or $4, right? I paid little extra. It's the same electricity which is coming. No change in your power, in your uh, industry. Same electricity which is coming. All you have done is you have moved your portfolio here. When you put up a boundary here, initially when you were doing your product and you were putting the electricity, you were calculating it as fossil-based or let's say a coal-based electricity. Now what I have done, it's the same electricity, same electrical line. Instead of coal, I'm now saying it is solar, right? So it is solar electricity. The moment it becomes solar, now because solar carbon footprint and embodied emissions are lower, your product emissions per product, you know, per liter of bottle that you're producing has also gone down. So this is uh, how you could green your system. Other thing is, which is, I suppose is even better than this, is, as I told you, you have your own roof, you set up your own solar plant, and you take less from fossil. This will give you, you know, you have to see physically also that some change is happening. So on the roof of your roof of your industry, you set up solar plant, if you're at a height, and if you get good wind speed, set up a wind power plant of your own, we call it the captive generation, and feed yourself, feed your energy demand. And whatever, if you're using 100 units, if you have producing 10 units from here, ask them to supply you only 90 units. So these are various kinds of uh, tools that are available. You can play along to green your portfolio. The same applies for power plant. Now power plant cannot say that their whole job is to produce power, right? So they cannot say, okay, okay fine, I'm replacing my coal with solar. No, you are a power plant and you are a coal-based power plant. I can, in, in, a, you know, in a boiler, I cannot put in solar. I cannot put in radiation and say that it will produce electricity. No, I know I have to run a steam cycle for that. I need steam and it will come from, it, the, the boiler is designed to take coal only. So it will take coal only. So the degree of freedom here is zero for a power plant. But what it can do, power plant has its emissions. This is what is accounted for, right? If I put a boundary here, here is a coal which is coming in. It has its own embodied uh, emissions because of extraction and mining and coal preparation, it is dirty. And here I'm burning it and I'm releasing it, making it even more dirtier. So my product has this, you know, double penalty, one because of this coal and second because of this emission. So what is it that I can do? I can reduce this emission. Can I do something about it? And this is where CCUS is coming up. What they are doing, they're capturing the, uh, the flue gas from the stack and they are capping it not releasing and therefore the, the carbon footprint or the emission footprint of the electricity that they are producing is going down. This is how it works, right? And you reduce, that is about the product. But otherwise also uh, look at the supercritical power plants or combined cycle power plants. What they are doing, one set of electricity is produced through the steam cycle and second set of electricity is produced uh, sorry, the combined cycle, basically what it does, it takes coal, first set of electricity is produced from the gasification of the coal. The second set is whatever is the spent heat that is remaining after the combustion of the gases that is used to run the steam cycle. So the same amount of coal, initially it was combustion, steam cycle. Now gasification, one gas turbine and residual heat, steam turbine. So the same amount of coal is now used to run two cycles. That's why they call it the combined cycle. So the amount of electricity now produced is more. It's the same thing. Earlier, the amount of coal that is that will go in your uh, denominator remains, sorry, that go in your numerator remains same. Your denominator has now increased. That was the number of per unit electricity. Now number of electricity has gone up. So the emission factor would go down because the number in the denominator is now bigger 
then the number in your numerator, which was coal as an input. The same amount of coal is now producing more amount of electricity, more units of electricity. Therefore, per unit distribution has gone down. So these are the calculations that, are, uh, that we do to ensure that your portfolio becomes more and more green or more or more, the carbon footprint basically goes down. So as you can see here, industries are now looking for this green way. I just explained it to you, the government. And then to do that, you know, to do that, why will you buy a, you know, why will you buy a solar-based electricity? Anyway, you have to end up paying more price for it. Who will install a solar? I mean, solar probably, uh, if, if I talk about India for that matter, the price of solar has actually gone down on the price of fossil uh, for power production. So coal-based power plant is costing more than the solar power plants, right? So that is, could be an exception. Globally, this is what is happening. But initially when, you know, and, and the price that, why the solar price have gone down because solar has diffused very fast. And why solar has diffused very fast? Because of the policy push. All the policies that have been uh, formulated and executed in favor of solar. So this policy push is important. Now, initially, as I told you, when the solar was costing higher than fossil, why would you take a solar? Fine, I bought a solar, it greened my portfolio, but then my product cost has also gone up. Very simple. Initially, what I was getting in $3, now I am paying $4 for it. So of course, my final product price would go up. Why would, a purple, why would the customer buy it from me? So what they have done, they have said, okay, fine, we will give you some kind of incentive, again, the policy incentive, maybe in the form of reduced interest rate for your loan. Since you are proposing a green business, the bank would give you loan at a lower interest rate, right? So on and so forth. So all these market mechanisms have to be checked, have to be brought in place. Not so easy job, but the countries and governments are doing it. Therefore, you see governments are looking to regulate the economic activity and consumer behavior to minimize environmental pollution. You, if you are using uh, many countries, uh, India for that matter, I could talk about it, that there is a buyback policy. So whenever you try to buy a mobile phone, yeah, you see that the companies are always giving you an offer that you, uh, we will buy back your old mobile phone because the average life of a mobile phone globally is found out to be two years. So every two years, you change your mobile phone. So by this, what they mean is uh, that after two years, when you change your mobile phone, it's, it's not that uh, it, it won't work anymore or uh, you know, it, is, it's, uh, it has come to an end of its life. No, it's just that the industry has progressed further from 2G, 3G, 4G, you have now moved to 5G. Therefore, your phone is obsolete kind of thing, right? It's not, it's not up to the mark or uh, in sync with the modern technology. But all the material that has gone into it is still there. If you open up a phone and you see, you see that there are some gold that are used in there, there are some silver, there are some other uh, precious uh, metal in there. Just to share with you, per kg of e-waste, electronic waste, has more gold than per kg of gold ore. Right? So when you extract gold from a gold ore, from the mineral where the ore, gold is there, the concentration of gold is less. But if you extract, say, one ton of e-waste, the amount of gold in one ton of e-waste is more than the amount of gold in one ton of the gold ore. Yes, that what I'm trying to say here is that the material is still there. The gold is still there in those chips. The gold is still there on the motherboard of your phone, right? So they try to, that's the reason the companies are buying it back and the government is also pushing it, right? The policy push is also there that you buy it back. And to see that you are, you know, there is uh, all these win-win situations are created. They give you certain discounts that we will give you 10%, 20% discount in the, the total price of the phone, you buy, uh, we will, you exchange your phone with us, right? So these are the things why they are doing it. So they collect it so that multiple reasons so that they could extract out the material and they can dispose it off in a more scientific way rather than you and I probably we will end up throwing it in our garbage bin. And then it will go and 
offset and pollute the landfills as well because there are certain uh, toxic materials that are also there in our foams, inside the foams, right? So these are the things how we are trying to bring in circularity in every step of our uh, business and every step of our action, right? And all the life cycle analysis is about assessing the sustainability of the product and making it more green. There are certain agencies who certify you that this is a green product. What do you mean? So they do the entire analysis, all these calculations they do, and then they uh, rank you in terms of greenness index and something similar, right? So life cycle assessment, it is uh, its origin from the idea of sustainability proposed under Agenda 21. So the very first keynote speaker did talk about Agenda 21. And life cycle is a tool that is determined that that is to determine and evaluate the environmental impact of a product, process, or service. Anything, you can do a life cycle analysis of anything. Even a, a simple process, which is a part of a, your entire processing line can also be assessed individually. In fact, this is how the life cycle analysis is carried out. Every process is individually evaluated and then they are put together for the product analysis. And similar is the case with services as well. Right, these are various definitions of life cycle assessment as we can see here. Primarily to check the sustainability, how sustainable, how green, how uh, responsible you are towards your future generation kind of behavior that you have. And yes, uh, all these things, I mean, broadly is mentioned here, product design, environmental design, I think I've already covered it. Uh, post noon session, you will be doing some kind of a hands-on on this very briefly so that the whole idea is to uh, when you see this number, please don't get fooled. Please don't get baffled. Don't get uh, intimidated. They are very, I mean, you could do it. They are complex, but not impossible to do it, right? They are, otherwise, they are plain, simple mathematics. Getting those numbers is a bit of a challenge. We call it the database. If you have the database with you, and if you have uh, drawn your boundaries well, and if you understand your system well, then it's very simple mathematics that you have to put in place because uh, that's the beauty of life cycle analysis. All the databases, at least for the, for the first principles point of view, is available with us. And uh, we could estimate something. Well, even if you have come up with an estimate which is very broad, which is not very accurate, you have some number, you have something on the table to start discussing or to start taking action on rather than not having anything. Okay. So, you know, um, as you could see in here, right, 1963 perhaps uh, was the first time when we started talking about this life cycle oriented study and Coca-Cola was the first company uh, who studied it, right? Who studied uh, the beverage container of, uh, of the resource and environmental profile analysis. So they are the one who did it probably for the first time in the history of life cycle analysis as we understand it today, right? And then uh, US EPA 1974, when they came up with their first study on life cycle analysis. Yeah, right. And the first, you know, the, the commercial software, like, you know, as before that, before 1989, as you can see here, it was all about uh, some company doing it in its in its very primitive form. Uh, as such, there was no methodology available for everyone to use it. it. Even if it was there, the method, as you can see here, was developed in the 1980s. But to uh, put it to a, a very simple software so that anybody can use it, or the first commercial software, let me put it this way, came in 1989. So it's a fairly new thing. We are still developing it in its first version. Right now, we are at a different version. You will get a feel of all that in the next class. Uh, Gabby was the first commercial software, then another commercial software, which is, uh, I think, used more, is more popular nowadays, is the SEMA Pro. And uh, yeah, and they are the one who coined this life cycle assessment. They coined this term, the life cycle assessment, as we know it today as LCA. And yes, and you can see here, uh, CITAC is an organization which published the code of practice to harmonize life cycle framework terminologies and methodologies, because there are many agencies, many identities, those who have come up with their methodologies, like oh, what are the things you have to include? What is it that you are doing? How to include, where to include, what are the databases and how to incorporate it? And, and this primarily because all of them were uh, creating their own symphony. 
right? And this organization tried to bring them all together so that there is a seamless shift or, you know, you could like use the terminologies so that all of them are in sync and talking in same terms, right? So this is briefly about life cycle analysis, how it came into existence. Yes. Um, then the journal also came into existence. Then ISO 14, 14040 standard. That's a framework and principles that are given in their goals and scope, how it is defined. So ISO, as you understand, is the certificate is a certification organization uh, globally known to everyone. So they also kind of enjoyed the bandwagon of life cycle analysis and they try to mainstream it even further. All the damage indicators, we will be talking about it in a moment from now, that came into existence slowly and slowly. The whole idea is that as we moved forward, it evolved, right? And as you can see here, uh, this is the database in 2003. It was incorporated into LCI database. It was EcoInvent version 1.10 was released. So databases, for example, like per unit of fossil-based electricity, what is the load of emissions or GHG emissions on it? So such basic data, are available in this database. So it's, in fact, this is the backbone of any life cycle analysis. As I told you, if you have any query, hold it. We will be doing it in the next class and we will see how it work. And then slowly we brought in the angle of sustainability also in the framework. From sustainability, we have now brought in the social angle also into it. So you can see it is evolving. Something which just started initial years as the material and energy flows to study how the material and how the energy is flowing or is used, it has come to a point where we are now studying the social impact of such actions as well. So that is what life cycle analysis is all about. Various kinds of life cycle analysis are done, various variant. One is the cradle to grave. It is the full life cycle assessment of the resource extraction. So if you're talking about ship that is used for transportation, then we go and track to a level where the iron and steel, the iron that is used, even in the steel industry to manufacture that ship, how it is extracted. So that is the cradle right from the very beginning to where it is disposed of. The product that you are using, it's used, t-shirt, you have used it, it has been disposed of as well, it has gone to its grave. Very extensive, a uh, lot of things, even if you look at it, even, you know, the things that you have outsourced are also taken into consideration. So if you are procuring the nuts and the bolts and the screws from some other uh, organization, how have they procured it? Even that could be brought into your cradle to grave calculation. So it is very elaborate, very, very extensive. Okay, that is called as the cradle to grave. The other is the cradle to great. That means I am not dwelling into uh, the domain of the consumer. As you can see here, that is before it is transported to the consumer because I don't know the consumer behavior. It could be that the consumer is aware enough to dispose it of scientifically. Maybe the consumer is not, right? So I don't know how the consumer would be behaving. I only know up to my gate. When it leaves my factory premises, what it is. So I am considering all the raw material that I'm using, my outsourcer is using, my suppliers are using, the electricity that I'm using, where it is coming from, is it fossil-based, coal-based, whatever, what is coming into my factory and their loaded emissions, plus what is leaving my factory gate. This is my concern. Look at it, the previous one, if we go to the last one, it is beyond that. The user phase and the sorting and end of life is also considered. Here, I'm not interested in this. I'm only interested till my factory thing, right? So this is cradle to gate. Then there is cradle to cradle. That means I have also considered the end of the life, the social responsibility and the recycling part of it. I gave you the example of the mobile phones. That's what they are doing. And it is giving them green credit. It's not just everything that we are doing is for, uh, uh, is, is out of social uh, you know, uh, guilt or awareness, there is also a business to it. It is, it is, it is enriching my green portfolio, <clears throat> right? And, and, and it's, it's adding to my reputation, right? So all those things are there. So you can see here in cradle to cradle, as you understand, 
from cradle, it went to the grave and from grave, it is kind of in rebirth and it has come to its uh, re-existence, right? So cradle to cradle again. Then gate to gate, primarily from factory only. I don't know what my uh, suppliers are doing. I'm only interested in what's happening in my gate as an input, what is coming in my gate and what it is leaving from my gate. This is one of the most convenient form of uh, LCA to perform because you do it within the factory premises only or the power plant premises only. You know the premises, you know the physical boundary and you perform your analysis within that boundary only. And you could see here that gate to gate and the cradle to gate or cradle to grave, they're all subset of the bigger picture, right? It's the same, it's the same flow diagram that I'm using and I'm just putting the boundaries across different identities. Right, and then there is a well to wheel. And as you can understand, this well to wheel is primarily uh, done for uh, oil and gas industry, right? So from well, it is extracted to, it is fueled into your uh, tank of your vehicle, the gas tank. So for them, they have a different route altogether, right? So they have come up with their own uh, variant of LCA, which is very for transport sector, basically, right? Talking about from the well, from the well, to the wheel. So what, how do you do that? How do you perform that? Right? All of us, if we do it, we will read it differently. And per unit, per kilometer that the car is driving, whatever is your functional unit based on which you are reporting your uh, intensity will vary if we don't follow the same methodologies. Right. So this well to wheel gives a methodology so that I, you, or anybody follow the same methods, follow the same step, and more or less come to the same uh, conclusion, right, in terms of their emissions. Yes, um, yes, I think I have, I have already covered that, that it is uh, not just, it's all about quantifying, where you absolutely don't have any data, you may say it in qualitatively that it is uh, the way we draw the Shanky diagram, that it is very polluting, you identify the hotspot, but in all cases, we try to quantify it, we try to give some number to it. Yes. Of course, it, the, the biggest advantage of LCA, as I told you, is to take an informed decision, uh, generate your own, uh, in, uh, we call it the registry of your own emissions. Every country which is a signatory to the, uh, to the climate action plan, which is part of COP, are doing it. You know, if you want to know, if we say that this is the emission of this particular country, it is only coming from because we are performing some kind of a life cycle analysis. It, it could be gate to gate, but we are doing such analysis, right? So it is helping the governments to take informed decision. It is helping the industries to identify their hotspot, which they were not doing as long as uh, they were working under the linear economy uh, kind of an uh, scenario, right? So it is helping all of them and it is helping non-government organizations as well to aware people uh, to, you know, to push climate action uh, through their various tools and techniques that they use. But as I told you, it is, uh, it is not all win-win with LCA. It has its own set of limitations as well, and we should be aware of it. More than the benefit, it is important that we know what are the uh, limitations so that uh, uh, when we take informed decision, we should be aware of what these uh, limitations are. And it is a complex and processes uncertainties over implementation of results. Now, once the results are given to you, that's why I say that when you see any number, if you ever see, please question it. Right? That how has this number come? What is the functional unit that I have identified? You know, the, the emissions that I'm reporting. Am I reporting it on the product? Am I reporting it on the service? Am I reporting it? Or how am I reporting it? Right? And uh, how have I calculated it? What methodology I have used? What kind of an emissions I have used? I tell you, for example, when you, when you do this, if the idea is to identify the carbon, if idea is to identify the energy intensity of any of your product, right? How much energy it is, how much electricity it is consuming, for example, right? And 
the functional unit that you have used is uh, uh, you know is is for ghg emissions the lca that you have performed is primarily for the ghg emissions how much of emission that is happening and for any reason for the ghg emissions and for the uh, for the lca calculations as well if you have used a green energy you procured you procured you used you are still using 10 units of electricity or 100 units of electricity in your factory but on the product it is reflected uh, you know the intensity is reflected less because these 100 units all of them are actually green or solar right so if i just look at a chart if i look at it i see that okay uh, the intensity the ghg intensity of my product is very low which also means that i have used very little electricity then i'm completely wrong right so i need to study that the ghg intense the low ghg intensity of my product is because i have purchased green electricity the number or the unit of electricity i have used is still 100 right it's just that i have paid less i mean i have paid a little more and i have converted my fossil based electricity or considered my electricity as a green electricity because i have paid for it but if you are studying this whole supply chain primarily to identify the hotspots where who are the major energy guzzler guzzling process then you will be uh, uh, you know you will be misinformed I hope I have made myself clear, right? So if, if you look at the carbon intensity or the GHG intensity of your product, and based on that, you say that my, my product is using less electricity, then maybe I'm wrong. And I told you maybe I'm wrong because the lower intensity of the lower GHG intensity of my product is because I'm buying a green energy. In my portfolio, I have bought a green energy. Buying a green energy doesn't mean using less energy you are still using the same amount of energy. And the major hotspot, let's say in your processing plant is a, uh, is a melter, is a smelter where all the burning happening, all the melting happening, is still using 50% or 80% of the total energy that you have procured. So if you are trying to make your system less energy intensive, energy intensive, I'm not talking about GHG int intensive, then the information that you're getting from GHG intensity will probably uh will not give you the right form of information or maybe confuse you right? so it is important so when you see these numbers you have to be uh very careful it's time location and resource specific technologies that we are using i gave you the example of power plant the same amount of coal when it is put in china put in india put in germany put in usa put in your country would give different amount of electricity so if i'm calculating the emission of per unit of electricity, right? Though all of us are using the same amount of coal, our LCA values would be different because we all have access to different kinds of technologies that we are using, right? And if you bring in the social angle also, as you saw in the last slide, then how we are treating our workers, that also come into existence. What kind of facility am I am providing? Am I providing the designated space which UN identifies for uh, a decent working space in a factory? Am I providing that or not? So all those things will also come into picture. So based on that, uh, the results will vary. And data, as I told you, in absence of any data, majority of us don't have the inventory data available with us. Uh, I'm sure every industry has its own data. It's absolutely impossible that if you have an accounts department, it doesn't know uh, where the money is going and uh, what kind of an, uh, payments that are being done. But uh, you know, uh, putting it in a right format and making it available to the public, uh, sharing it with your citizens is not what every country is doing it. So reliability of data and sometimes uh, uh, they also fudge data. We know what the famous car company also did, right? So this is important that uh, the kind of data that we are getting, not necessarily it's all sacrosanct. It's, uh, it should be taken as it is. We must, uh, there, there, is, there is always a degree of uh, inaccuracy there as well. 
And of course, the assumptions that you are making, the kind of assumptions that we are making, that also could bring in uh, some inconsistency, inconsistency in, uh, in the results and uh, the real, what is happening in, in reality. Right, uh, LCA does not include the economic and the social part of it, but then there are LCOE, which does consider uh, the social and uh, the economics part of it. Then there are other, which is using the social aspect as well, but LCA as such, the LCA, this acronym doesn't use uh, this aspect. Yes, so as you can see here, therefore, uh, you could read it. There is uh, no rocket science here. We perform LCA primarily to check our sustainability, the kind of uh, damage that we are bringing to the nature. We should try to minimize it. What are the hotspots in my supply chain where I can bring in some action to reduce it? This is what is the bottom line of all LCAs. Right? And every industry, every uh, Every, every industry, every service sector, factories, production plants, they must perform their analysis, their life cycle analysis, their inventory analysis to see, um, uh, you know, to, to gauge the kind of degradation they are bringing to the environment or what kind of an, uh, service they are bringing to the environment. The, the organizations who are actually capturing carbon and they are converting it into a product, they claim it differently. So, uh, yeah, we should gauge, we should quantify, the whole idea of LC is to quantify the change that we are bringing into the nature, positive or the negative. If positive, how we could make it more positive. If negative, how we could reduce the impact of that uh, negative change is what we are more interested in. Right, I think with this, we have come to an end. If you have any query, I'll be more than happy to answer. Oh, oh, I could see that you have written the numbers here, but uh, since I was on a screen sharing mode, I couldn't see it. But yes, you are right. Uh, can we buy RECs? Uh, I, okay, uh, yes, we can. I gave you the example of uh, RECs, right? The renewable, uh, renewable energy certificates. So that's what the companies are doing. Either you are buying it from the grid or you are buying it from uh, uh, the certificate itself, uh, India did it. India, for example, sells the renewable energy certificate. Many countries are doing it. This is how they're trying to make their portfolio more and more green. Can power industry become circular economy? They must try to. Whether they can become or not is uh, absolute circularity is a different story. Um, I think absolute circularity is something which is not possible in the current uh, uh, scenario, right? Especially if you're talking about the fossil-based system. But the idea is, look at things. Are, things are not always zero and one, right? There is, there are numbers in between zero and one as well. And in the race, I mean, if we say today that uh, uh, the climate change will not happen, I'll be, I'll be telling a lie to you. I'll be, I'll be an absolute idiot to say so. Right, but then can we can we elongate it? You know, this 1.5 degree change, two degrees change. Can we ensure that instead of happening in next 10 years time, we slow down one thing, we make our systems more efficient, and we uh, change our you know uh, bring in circularity so that instead of we call it the business as usual, the way we are moving. So we see that. If we go by the assumptions, if you go by the numbers, it says that there is about 0.2 to 0.3 degree rise in temperature, the global temperature every 10 years, the way we are progressing. And we call it the business as usual, right? This is the business as usual model. Now the whole idea is to bring in change. We will be working, power plants will be there. We need electricity. We, we have seen the benefits of electricity, right? What changes we can do so that this three degrees instead of bringing it in 10 years time, can I make it happen over 25 years time or maybe 100 years time? 
So what are changes that we can do about it? So this is what is circular, bringing circularity into your system. And capturing power, uh, emissions is, is a way bringing in the circularity into your system. You are capturing the CO2, you are converting it into a product. Yeah, I'll show you. I, uh, in the next class, I'll show you a product. During this pandemic time, there is an industry which was capturing CO2 uh, from a power plant and they were converting it into, into, into sanitizers. They were converting it into alcohol. Alcohol, yeah, it should. So yes, you can bring in circularity. Absolute circularity, I don't know. People are working on it. But even if you reduce your emissions by, you know, by 10%, 20%, 25%, 50%, and all the power plants together bringing it down, bringing it down by 20%, certainly we will push the climate change. Uh, so you are right. There is another uh, stream of LCA. We call it LCOE, life cycle LCCE, life cycle costing analysis LCCA, right? Then LCOCE. There, there are many variants of it, right? There is one which focuses on economics as well. There is one which doesn't consider the economic. It only focuses on emissions. It doesn't consider the cost. So uh, and. For all of them, our methodologies are there. You'll be studying about it in the next two classes after lunch. What are the various forms of LC? This is the life cycle analysis, which primarily deals with uh, the emissions and the impact because of those emissions. So the, emission, the impact would be climate change, ozone layer depletion, for example, right? Impact on your health, impact on ocean. So primarily with the ecology, the, the system, the ecosystem. This does not consider the cost part of it, right? But then there is a branch of life cycle analysis. We call it, as I told you, it's life cycle costing analysis, LCCA, that along with all these things also consider the costing part of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, enjoy your lunch. And we will see you after an hour time from now. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.